Yes, I was glad, oh so glad when they said to me, let's go into the house of the Lord today. There's singing and dancing and victory in the house of the Lord today. So we've had singing, we haven't had dancing, but we do have victory. Amen. Amen. Uh, we are, are strongly thinking about selling our old Dodge van out there, no. 15 passenger, yes. <laughs> and uh, it's been a faithful old gal for a long time. <laughs> And we, we took the seats out of it, and, you know, we, we go and uh, pick up food at Walmart uh, every Wednesday. So it's a bread truck now. It's not a bread yeah, so, uh, and it's been a blessing because, you know, uh, last year we gave out 32,000 pounds of food from Walmart, and, and this year we're on track to do that also. And uh, so... We took the seats out of the van, and, and me and Mark, you know, we're, we're not no spring chickens. And uh, so we get about 1,400 pounds of food from Walmart, and some of it's pretty heavy. And so I have to get up in that van and, you know, walk it back and stack it and walk it back. And then when I'm done, I'm, I'm walking like this <laughs> for about a week. And... Uh, so <laughs> So we decided if we could sell that van for maybe eight, you know, I don't know, eighteen, nineteen hundred, we could buy a trailer and uh, use that to pick the food up. But this way, we could just wheel the stuff in there and wheel it out, and uh, we could put a hitch on the Ford van and just use that to go up there and pick it up. And then also, Trail Life could probably use the trailer also, you know, for for their campouts and everything. So we're going to be moving in that direction. Uh, so if you know anybody that wants to buy a wonderful, <laughs> <laughs> faithful van, <laughs> you know, we we got the one just for you. <laughs> so, but it it's been a good van. But I'm thinking about my back. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about spiritual growth this morning, and. Uh, you know, I've been a Christian for over 40 years, and, uh, you know, I've, I've seen some things that work and seen some things that don't work. Uh, there's a, an insurance commercial, I don't know if you've ever seen it or not, State Farm, and uh, they got this museum of all the insurance th things that they've covered, you know, and they got a, a, a model of this guy drove his car over through the roof, and, and, uh, and he tells the guy with him, he says... Uh, you know, we've, we've uh, know a lot, we've seen a lot, and, and we know a lot, you know, so they've covered all, just about everything, you know, all kinds of weird things. And uh, so in our Christian lives, we, we know some things that, that, you know, that we've learned in our Christian life, how to grow spiritually and, and what keeps us from growing spiritually. And so we learned those things over the years. And uh, and so none of us want to be spiritual midgets. We all want to continue to grow spiritually. Amen? Yes. And uh, so there's some things that help us grow, and there's some things that hinders our growth. And just like in the natural, there's some things that will h help you physically and to grow, and, uh, and there's some things uh, spiritually that will help us to grow and and uh, there's things also that will stunt your growth spiritually. And so we want to we wanna grow spiritually. When, when do we stop growing spiritually? Anybody know? When you when you die. Huh? When you die, when you die. yeah. And then, uh, you know, the Bible says well, that we know in part, you know, we'll, we'll know everything. You know, we'll understand everything, and God will, uh, will be transformed. So this morning... Uh, I want to talk about the hidden things of God because God always, you know, he wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to reveal himself to the world. And, you know, as we've been studying the book of Revelations, it's, it, John pointed out that it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was God, it was Jesus revealing himself in different ways to John. And in every letter that uh, the Lord wrote to the seven churches, he described himself in different ways. So the Lord wants to reveal himself to us. I mean, 
uh, eternal life is, is in the bag. We have that, you know. Uh, the Bible says that, you know, we're, if we're born of God, we have eternal life. But the, the main thing while we're here on this earth, God wants us to grow in him spiritually. And so one thing that I have discovered over my years with walking with the Lord is that God hides things from us. And the reason he hides things from us is because he wants us to seek him so he can reveal them to us. And uh, in Matthew 13, 44, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a hidden treasure in a field which a man uh, has found and covered up. So it's hidden. <clears throat> and uh, then for his joy, he goes and sells everything that he has that he could buy the field. So it, it's like a hidden treasure that this guy went and, and, and he sold everything that he has that he can possess that treasure. And then there's a the parable of the pearl of great value. And it says the kingdom of God, of, or the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the Bible says we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. And God wants us to, uh, to seek him out, to uh, go after him so he could reveal and we could discover the things that God has for us. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25 and at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed to, uh, them to little children. And then Ephesians 3, <clears throat> 1 through 10. And to make all men see, Paul wrote this, what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ <clears throat> to the intent now that unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church. How many are in the church? See, these things might be known unto us, the manifold wisdom of God. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given to me to you word, how that by revelation, by revelation, see we get, <clears throat> we get revelation through our spirit, not through our head, but God reveals things to us by his spirit. How many have ever been reading the Bible and you might have read that verse before, but all of a sudden, whoa, that really just jump out, jumps, jumps out to you. That's because the spirit of God has revealed something to you. <clears throat> and so, by the revelation may be known the, uh, unto me the mysteries, as I wrote aforetime in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mysteries of Christ, which in the other age was not made known unto the sons of men, but is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit." that the Gentiles <clears throat> should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Wherefore, I am made a minister according to the gift of grace of God, given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less and least of all the saints. Is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent now that unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So the world is is going to understand God through the church by the manifold wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. 
But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto glory. And then Colossians 1.26 Even the mysteries which have been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. How many saints of God do we have in here? I'm Saint Joseph. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) Under construction, I might add. (laughs) Yeah. But now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory. God wants to make known what what is the riches of his glory among the Gentiles, which is which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, which is Christ in you, the expectation of God's glory, which is Christ in you the expectation of God's glory. So you're going to manifest the glory of God in your life. You know, in the Old Testament, there's many ways that God manifests his glory. He manifests his glory through the cloud uh, and the pillar of fire that he led the children of Israel. Uh, But today, he manifests his glory in you. You You are God's glory walking around this earth. When I see and know some people that God has restored, all I could say is glory to God. And that's what they are. They're, in Ephesians chapter 1, it's mentioned four times that we should be to the praise of his glory. That we should be to the praise of his glory. In other words, when people see your life, you're like that reflector, you reflect God's glory. And he gets the praise for it. So God wants to reveal stuff to us. He wants to make known these mysteries to us, the church. So if some things of God are hidden, how do we find them? Matthew 7, 7 explains it. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Seek, and you shall find. I remember when I first got saved, or before I got saved, the thing that was driving me the most was I wanted to find the reality of life. And I knew it was it was, wasn't in the material realm. So I started getting into all kinds of weird spiritual things, found out that those were real. But when I found out that God was real, when I, I, I found a friend of mine who led me to the Lord who was an ex-heroin addict, and he told me, and I seen the, the life of God in him because he used to live with me when I lived in Alabama, and he was, he was burnt out on drugs. He was a heroin addict. And I saw the change in his life like day and night. And he, I saw the glory of God in him. I mean, he couldn't make sense. He couldn't carry out a sentence. He was just a burnout mess. And I saw the change in his life, and he told me about Jesus. And I accepted the Lord. And I found, I found the reality of God in Christ. I I understood that the spiritual things were real. And so I had to, I didn't even know if other people had the experience I just had. I didn't know what you call it. I didn't know what you do with it or anything. And so I start finding other people who had the same experience. And back then it was called, they were called Jesus people. They were people who were getting saved off the streets and, and meeting together in coffee houses and small groups and stuff because the church wouldn't let them in because they were barefoot and they had long hair. 
and uh, and so I remember that we were we would <clears throat> this one church this pastor who let us in and uh, and he just accepted everybody uh, and we used to sit out in that parking lot until two or three in the morning just praying and seeking God because we were hungry we wanted to grow spiritually and <clears throat> And I, I think that same fervency and, and zeal we should keep throughout our walk because God doesn't want to withhold anything from us. He wants to reveal more to us. Yeah. And the reason we, we get uh, complacent in our walks and the reason we, we feel sometimes get burned out and, is because we quit seeking God. We quit seeking God. Because, man, how many believe the Bible's real? And, and it's true. The Word of God is true. Yeah. Okay, I, I just, I'm setting you up. Ask, and what happens? It, it'll be given. Seek, and what happens? You'll find. What if you don't seek? You don't find it. If I was... Before church, if I would have hit a thousand dollar check underneath the or a thousand dollar bill, I don't even know if they make a thousand dollar bill. Uh, if I would have hung it under one of these chairs, and I would have said, "Okay, if you if you find the money where I've hit it, it's yours." And I'm sure everybody would get up and start looking under chairs. But if you just sat there, you'd never find it. And so, <clears throat> it's the same way with God. This is a promise with a condition. If you seek me, you're going to find me. You know, I, I remember witnessing to a guy, and man, I, 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 was, I was just laying it out. I, I, was, I gave him Romans' road of salvation, and I feel like I, I had him right where I went, and, and, and I was getting ready to play just as I am and invite him down to the altar. <laughs> and, and the Lord spoke to me and said, that's enough. I wanted another notch on my salvation belt, but God said, that's enough. Just tell him to seek me. And I did that and walked away. And I don't know what happened to that guy, but I know that this scripture is real. If anybody, any man, woman, or child seeks God, they will find him. Right. Somebody says to me, well, I don't believe that God is real. I say, well, just start seeking him. Just start looking for him. And I guarantee you that you will find him. Now, once they find him, they might not like what they find. They might reject him. But I guarantee you, if you seek him, you'll find him. Seek, <clears throat> seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. We, we looked at that painting last week of, at Revelations. At, uh, seek, and you, or knock, and it shall be open unto you. And the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will hear my voice, I will come into him and, and fellowship with him and he with me. So God's knocking on people's hearts. He just wants them to open the door. Knock and it shall be open unto you, for everyone that asks receives. And he that seeks does what? Finds. And to him that knocks it shall be open. Or what man is there of you whom if the son asks bread, will he give him a stone? I mean, can you imagine if your, your little child comes up to you and says, can I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you give them a box of rocks. <laughs> I mean, God's better than that. And if we seek him, we're going to find him. Or what if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? I've discovered this, that we can have as much as of God as we want. We can have as much as God as we want. The, the Bible just amazes me because I don't care how many times you've read it, how many, how many times you've memorized Scripture, it's always speaking life. Amen. It's a living Bible. 
It's always given us new stuff. To the degree that we seek him is to the degree that we know him. You know, I, th- I think of Polycarp. He was a bishop of, of the church in, in Revelations, and, and uh, there was um, Caesar worship going around, and, and he would not take part in that. He was up in his 80 years old, and uh, they asked him to deny his faith, and he wouldn't do it. And he was burned at the stake for that. He said, how can I deny the Lord that's been so faithful for me, to me in my whole life? You know, and, and I often thought how these men give their lives for, for the gospel. But I believe that I, I understand that because God has become such a reality to them that the spiritual things have been more real than the natural. Seek and you shall find. To the degree we seek him is to the degree we know him. Hebrews 11.6 says it, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And listen to this. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Colossians 3.1 If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, when Jesus becomes your life and you live for him, then Christ shall appear. Hallelujah. Not Joe. But Christ. I mean, you don't want me to appear. Believe me. (laughs) But when Christ becomes our life, then Christ shall appear. And then we get to appear with him in glory. Like we're just on stage with him. But he's the top billing, the top credit. David said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me. I love that. How many have sought God, and the Lord's heard you? Isn't that awesome? I mean, that alone is more than enough. I sought the Lord, and he heard me. And delivered me from some of my fears. All of your fears? You mean even pandemic type fears? All of your fears. I sought the Lord and he heard me. And he delivered me from all of my fears. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The good example of this is found in 1 Kings 19.19. 19. And if you have a Bible with you, I want you to read this with me. This is about Elijah and Elijah. I get them mixed up, so if I get them turned around, just give me grace here this morning. <clears throat> First Kings nineteen nineteen through twenty one. So Elijah finds Elisha. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Seraphat, who was plowing with the twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he went with the twelve, and Elisha passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. His, his mantle was a sign of his anointing and his gifting. He by him, and he was plowing, and he cast it upon him. 
And uh, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. And, and he said, let me, I pray that you kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. So he said, let me go back and, you know, and take care of things and go back and see my family. And then Elisha said, go back again for what have I done to thee? In other words, maybe I've made a mistake. Maybe you're not the right guy for the job. And he said, <clears throat> and he returned back from him, and he took the yoke of oxen and slew them. So he didn't go back. He, when, he, when he heard him challenging him, and uh, he didn't go back, and he took the yoke of oxen, which was, you know, I guess his livelihood, and God was calling him out of that, and he gave unto the people, and they did eat. So they, he slaughtered the oxen, and they had a big old barbecue, and he arose and went after Elisha, Elijah and ministered unto him. So that was his first test. God was calling him into, the, into this ministry. And he challenged him. And he passed the test. So he was plowing with the 12 yoke of oxen before him. And Elijah found, found Elisha and called him to ministry Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And the mantle was a sign of the prophetic authority that he had. And he returned back from him and took the yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of oxen and gave unto the people to eat. And they arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. He was getting rid of his past and going after the future that God has got for him. And a lot of us hold on to our past and really don't look forward to what God has got for us. And so Elijah was making sure that that didn't happen, and he killed it. And then we pick up the story in 2 Kings 2.1. If you want to turn there. Elijah always was my favorite guy in the Bible. I mean, he was able to call fire down from heaven. You know, he was just awesome. And, uh, It came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah up into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went uh, with Elijah at, from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. Elijah, just wait here. I'm going on to Bethel. And But Elijah said as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came unto Elisha and said unto him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? And he said, Yeah, I know. Chill out. But Elijah said, I will not leave you. Elijah seemed his test to be devoted to Elisha since he was known that Elijah would soon depart from heaven in an unusual way. Gilgal, he, you know, he said, stay here at Gilgal. And uh, Gilgal, the prophets Hosea and, and Amos prophesied and condemned the worship of Gilgal as empty, empty ritual. So there's, there's places in our Christian life that, you know, sometimes your, your relationship with God or, or you know, you, you limit it or you, you, you reduce it down to just coming to church and singing a few songs and, and you know that you do that every Sunday and it becomes empty ritual. And Elijah said, why don't you just wait here? Why don't you just stay here? Because I've, I've got to go on. God's calling me on to Bethel. 
And so he said, as the Lord lives, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be on you like 99 on 100. I'm not going to leave you. He said, I will not leave you. And then, so they went down to Bethel. And Bethel met the house of God. But at the time uh, of this place, at the time this was taking place, it was a place of idolatry. And Elijah was saying to him, you know, that you could stay here where people worship things, and, and, but I'm going on to Jericho. And Elisha said, I will not leave you. Elisha said unto him, Elijah, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he says, as the Lord lives and thy soul lives, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And Jericho had, the, had fresh waters, springs were made in the oasis in the surrounding of the desert. And that's where the prophets lived. They lived where the glory of God came down. In other words, they kind of lived in a Christian bubble. They, didn't, they weren't concerned with the, the world. And You know, in the Old Testament, God used three classes of people, prophets, priests, and kings. And they were the ones that, they were the ones that God used and in in, uh, anointed to reach the world. And so they... They, you know, Jordan was the place, or Jericho was the place of fresh water where they just hung out in the Christian circles. And they didn't have a burden for the world or the lost. And so we, we could stay there, you know, we could stay there in the church and, and, and just enjoy the fellowship and enjoy what God's doing and everything, but not have a heart for, for the lost, not have a heart for the brokenhearted, not have a heart for those who are, who are in addiction. You know, Jesus said, I've come to heal the brokenhearted and set the oppressed free. So we could, we could stay in our Christian bubbles, but God wants to call us out further. That's where the prophets lived. That's where the Christianese lived. That's where they hung out. It's the good life, the good living in a Christian bubble, not having a desire to reach the people with hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And then in verse 5, And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Know that the Lord will take away your master from thy head today. And he answered, Yeah, I know. Hold your peace. And Elisha said unto him, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives, and as my soul lives, I will not leave you. And the two went up on, and the 50 men of the <coughs> sons of prophets went and stood to view afar off. And the two stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And when they were divided apart, so they went on to dry ground. Can you imagine that? You're walking along with this guy. You come up to this river, and he just smites the water, and it parts, and they walk on dry ground. <laughs> you go, whoa, that's awesome. I mean, this was the way this guy, you know, rolled. That was just his the way he operated. And uh, so <clears throat> he said, and they went down in 50 minutes of Jordan. Okay. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask what I shall do for you. In other words, he's saying, What do you want from me? Why, why are you just sticking with me? Why are you just like on me like 99 on 100? You're, you're just steadfast. You're unmovable. I can't get you to wait at Jericho or Bethel. You know, you're, you're, just, you're just dog face after me. What do you want? Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken away. And Elijah said, I pray to you, let me have a double portion of your spirit upon me. Wow. He, he wanted a double anointing of what Elisha had. 
I mean, everything that he did, he wanted to do double. And he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me, if you see me. In other words, he had to keep his eyes focused on him. If you see me, when I am taken from you, it shall be unto you. But if not, it shall not be so. So if he, he lost sight of the prize, he wouldn't receive that double anointing. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes. I love this. He took hold of his own clothes, and he rent them. His whole life, he just said, this is it. And he rent them. He tore them in two pieces. And he also took the mantle of Elijah that fell on him and went back and stood on the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell upon him and he smote the waters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, he got this mantle. He said, man, I'm going to try this thing out. And he smote the waters, and the waters parted. It's like Peter and John, as they came out of, uh, in the book of Acts, as they came out of, you know, the upper room, and they'd received the ba baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they came upon this lame man. And and the layman was asking for alms, but he got legs. Get it, alms, legs. But he was asking for money, and, he, and, the, and Peter, Peter and John said, silver and gold, we don't, we don't have anything, man, we're broke. Silver and gold have I none, but man, we just got something in the upper room, and he says, such as I have. In other words, that, that anointing, that power from God that I just received in the upper room, such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. Get up and walk. So Elijah parted the waters. And when the sons of the prophet, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, and they said, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Elijah, does rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That means that to pursue him with painstaking effort. Let me sum this message up by a game show that was very popular. How many remember the game show Deal or No Deal? <laughs> I love that. It was a good show. <laughs> but so I, I was thinking about this game. You know, and as I was watching it, I seen a lot of similarities to this. You know, uh, so y you've got these 26 cases they have up there, you know, on stage, and uh, you've got these slightly dressed women up there holding <laughs> the cases. But anyway, uh, these cases got different amounts of numbers in them, and so. And then there's one case that sits by, you know, the, the contestant. And so the object is, is to get the right cases without o exceeding a certain number. But there's also one case that has a million dollars in it. And so there, there's only a few people that ever won the million dollars. But there's a lot of them that came close. 
And when they, when they come close to winning that million dollars, there's a, this, a, this shadow of a person up in this booth, and they get kind of worried because they're getting close to win, winning the million dollars, and they call down there and says, well, we'll give them three or $400,000 if, if they make a deal. And so most of them who came close made the deal and didn't go on and go for the prize. And so they settle for a lower amount. You say, what's got that got to do with us? Well, a lot of times God is calling us higher. And and the devil gets worried because he sees, hey, we're you know, we're starting to read our Bible no more, we're attending church more, we're we're you know, we're getting hungry for God, we're worshiping, we turned off the country music and, and we now got Christian music on and, and uh, we're not watching things that's going to, you know, cause to, our, our, you know, problems with my walk and we're not entertaining thoughts and we're not looking at things that's going to cause us to, you know, to grieve the Holy Spirit. And the devil sees that, that you're really starting to get on fire for God and you're really starting to grow in Christ and all of a sudden there comes a phone call and the devil offers you, you know, compromise and he wants to make a deal with you. And a lot of Christians have leveled off and I've seen it so many times. They get to a place where God's getting ready to, you know, they come in all broken and some of them have addictions and God starts to restore their life and put things back together and and he's calling them. I've seen God getting ready to call people in the ministry and they say no deal. No deal. And they cut off the Spirit of God. Every day we have that opportunity. Even in small things, God wants us to grow. Maybe you've had trouble, you know, backbiting or, or gossiping or something. And, and, and the, the next time you get on the phone and you want to say something or talk about, and the Holy Spirit says, don't do that. That's when you say, okay, God. The devil wants you to, to make a deal, you know, with you and, and say you, well, you're comfortable and it's okay, you know. You, you know, you, you, you don't have to go any further. But don't make a deal with him. Make a deal with God. So this morning, I just want to challenge you that your spiritual growth is the number one priority in God's mind for for his people. It's not eternal life. It's being conformed to the image of Christ. I've known people that have been saved for 20 years and they're the same as they were when they first got saved. Now, are they saved? Yeah. That's not my call. But I know that they're missing out on the prize, the million-dollar case. They've settled for something less. Paul said this, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. He wasn't going to sleep, eat. He, He had his mind set on the prize. And he said that I might know him. His whole being wanted to know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. That I might know him. So we could, <clears throat> we could level out anywhere in our walk. And God will still love you. You'll still get blessed every once in a while. But God's got so much more for you. He wants to reveal so much more. Every time you give something to God, he gives you something of greater value. 
He reveals things to you. He blesses you spiritually with his riches. He manifests your, his glory upon your life. So, I don't know <clears throat> what God's speaking to your heart, but I guarantee you it's worth more. It's not worth as much as what God wants to give you in place of that. You know, Mother Teresa said this, because I don't believe we really have an understanding what God has got in store. The Bible says the eye, our eyes have not seen, our ears heard the things that God has prepared for us. We can't imagine the things God's prepared for us. Mother Teresa said this. She said that all the pain and, and suffering that we face in this world, being compared to the glory that God has for us, is like one bad night in a hotel. It, it doesn't even measure up to what God has got for us. So <clears throat> I want to encourage you. Do we have that song that I pulled up? We're going to sing, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. How many want to go higher? Glory to God. A couple of you. <laughs> <coughs> I mean do we, we never stop growing and seeking God make this a prayer this morning yes Jesus we're pressing in on the upper way I'm pressing Yes, God.
Jesus, I just pray this morning that you will give us a disdain for, for uh, mediocrity, Lord, for complacency, God, that you would put in our heart a desire to go higher and further with you, Lord, that we would seek you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, Lord God, that we could find you in new ways and new understanding that would strengthen our walk and we'd be able to manifest your glory in our lives in the days that we live in and be the church. In Jesus' name we pray.